what is another hot topic in, in advanced prostate cancer treatment, and that's the use of, uh, of PARP inhibitors. So let me just start with one case. A 74-year-old man with metastatic prostate cancer, his mother had breast cancer at age 37, presented with a PSA of 150, bone mats uh, started on uh, luprolide, uh, abiraterone, PSA starts rising, he goes on docetaxel, he progresses again. Um, and um, I'll talk. I'll go back to talking about him at the end. So, so the, you know, obviously, um, we've been talking a lot about this during this meeting. Um, Oliver gave a, in his overview talk uh, before the break. We were talking a lot about kind of the evolution and how important biomarkers might be um, in oncology in general. You can see from this slide. What's blue on the bars are biomarker-driven FDA approvals from the last 20 years, and what's red is uh, no biomarker involved. And you can see that basically more and more drugs are having associated biomarker. This is the promise of precision oncology, um, and I think we want to get to not giving everyone a therapy, not knowing if it's going to help them or not. We're gonna, we want to be as precise as possible, not just because of the cost uh, uh, to society, which is substantial, but also the cost to the patient. Uh, who wants to be on treatments that are not going to help them? And I think the other thing that's really truly changed over the last decade is the availability of really switching from single gene somatic changes, EGFR, of course, nearly 20 years ago, BRAF, uh, NTRAC, all of these single gene somatic changes that we were testing for and went from the laboratory into the clinic with drugs that targeted EGFR, for example. Uh, understanding more about the, the prevalence of germline changes. That's, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the context of prostate cancer. Now to really sequencing that is um, really at scale. Like It makes no sense to do uh, single gene testing anymore because not only because uh, the, the sample itself is quite valuable, but because the cost of doing whole exome or whole genome sequencing on a tumor sample is so low now this follows what, what we call Moore's Law. You remember uh, Moore just died recently. He was a founder of Intel and, and said that uh, the processing power would double every year. And in fact, that's exactly what happened with Moore's Law. It was constantly uh, improving uh, the chip capacity. And I think uh, uh, sequencing for genomics, genetic testing has, has really followed a similar rule. But this is just an interesting paper that looked at uh, kind of the feasibility of of, of uh, uh, genomic testing in a piecemeal way. Like if you do one test, two tests, three tests, et cetera, you, you basically, this is in lung cancer, um, you basically st uh, start to get more and more uh, use of the tissue and you actually, uh, to test five or more genes, uh, the samples were not adequate in a third of the patients. And if you try to test seven different genes individually, over half the samples are not adequate. So there are just too many genes and this is in lung cancer. We don't have, we're not, uh, in a situation in prostate cancer we, where we have that many genes that are relevant. But the truth is, because it's so simple to run the same platform for all cancers, it makes no sense to do individual piecemeal testing. Just as a reminder for this audience, although I'm sure all of you know, there is a difference between somatic and germline testing in, in cancer, right? So again, germline is what you inherit from your mother or father, and somatic is what uh, happens to you during your lifetime for because of exposures or environment, and and the only important part of this is that germline has consequent germline testing genomic testing has consequences for your family, uh, whereas somatic um, has uh, consequences just for you and your own specific cancer. Um, uh, germline, of course, will also affect your cancer, and, and we can talk a little bit on the panel about whether there's a difference, let's say, in BRCA mutations. Um, in germline or, or, or somatic uh, situations. The other thing that I think is happening more and more, and again, this is somewhat controversial, is whether or not genetic predisposition um, testing should be done you know, earlier and earlier. That is, why wait till a patient has symptoms of disease if you can actually start to incorporate germline testing earlier to even identify cancer risk? And again, the best example of this is in the BRCA world, but um, but I think we're going to learn more and more about um, about other risk factors that that um, that and maybe polygenic risks where it's not a single gene but um, but is uh, is really uh, a combination of genes. And there are some interesting registry studies. This is from the Mayo Clinic uh, breast cancer uh, group where they looked at uh, thirty nine thousand uh, thirty nine hundred consecutive breast cancer patients who who came into their clinic and uh, all had germline testing. 
So if you just take every cancer patient and do germline testing, um, uh, if uh, you actually would have missed, uh, if you followed NCCN guidelines, they would have missed 20 to 30% of those in this uh, clinic who actually had pathogenic variants in high-risk breast cancer genes. So in other words, you know, family history, NCCN guidelines, the complicated nature of those guidelines, they miss things. People don't even know their family histories. You know, there's a lot of hidden secrets we know from 23andMe about people's family or their p parents died or, or, um, or they were killed or other reasons why people don't understand their true family history. And this is another study um, also at Mayo Clinic uh, looking at universal germline testing for 80 known uh, genes across solid tumors. And again, 13% had pathogenic genetic variants, pathogenic genetic variants. That's a significant proportion of all cancer patients. And again, in this study across not just breast cancer, but all solid tumors, about half of them would not have met NCCN or other guidelines. So, you know, I, we've come a long way in the prostate cancer world of basically uh, recognizing that this is important, but my guess is that in many of your practices, you are not doing this. Uh, there's been a re reluctance from urologists, radiation oncologists, and I will say medical oncologists to actually do germline testing, um, but it's it's changing. I think these the, some of the people here are leaders in the field, but I know uh, many people are very, uh, very busy. There's one other study in MSK that showed a similar thing. Okay. So, let me go to prostate cancer and, and defining precision therapy and advanced prostate cancer. Well, we know prostate cancer has always had a, fa a familial risk. Um, this is an old slide that looks at the odds ratio of having uh, getting prostate cancer depending on whether you have a, a one, two, or three first degree relatives. And you can see, you know, the implication here is that there's familial, uh, there's familial risk, maybe because you live in the same house and you eat some of the same foods. But hereditary cancer, when you start to get three first degree relatives, you're really probably associating whether it's a known gene or an unknown gene or risk set of genes that are increasing your risk of developing prostate cancer. And of course, uh, I think this was like from, I don't know, t 10, 15 years ago when Angelina Jolie first pointed out that she had the BRCA gene. I, I can say that when I, when, you know, I was in the middle of seeing prostate cancer patients, I said, yeah, this is not really important for men with prostate cancer. Just to show you how much evolution there is. And that's one of the reasons was that some of the early data in localized prostate cancer suggested that the BRCA gene was altered in only 1% or 2% of all comers in prostate cancer. And that's because if you walk in with a Gleason 6 prostate cancer, you're not likely to be carrying a uh, germline BRCA mutation. But the, the, this, these studies um, from uh, Robinson and Pritchard uh, really started to transform the field. And you can see they were published only about seven years ago. So this is really, uh, eight years ago, this is really uh, evolving quite, has evolved quite dramatically in a short time. And I think the most important take home message is that about a quarter, about a quarter, 20 to 25 percent of all metastatic CRPC patients will harbor some DNA damage repair um, mutation, a pathogenic DDR mutation. About half of these are thought to be germline and half are somatic. Now, we were just debating this uh, I think, uh, yesterday and, and, and some people said, well, this just doesn't look like this in Arizona. It's not that high in Arizona. And I don't know. I mean, uh, we can hear what Alan has to say. I, I practice in New York. I think these are probably closer to real in New York, but you know, I think there's going to be geographic, ethnic, racial di di uh, differences. I showed a case yesterday of a of a Korean man with a uh, with a BRCA, uh, BRCA2 mutation, and I do think that the fact is that we probably aren't looking enough, don't know enough about certain populations. But let's just assume that about 20% have. Um, either a somatic or germline, and about half of those are, are germline. Um, so uh, just the two studies that I'm going to review really are related to the two approved uh, uh, PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer, uh, Olaparib from the Profound study and Rucaparib from the Triton studies. Um, so this is the Olaparib uh, trial looking at um, patients who had multiple, they actually looked at 14 different DDR mutations, and you can see they, were, they broke them down into two cohorts, BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM, and cohort B was all others, and they were randomized to a laparib versus physician's choice. These were all patients who had received prior um, novel hormonal therapy, and they could have received chemo, but they didn't have to receive chemo. 
And their primary endpoint was RPPFS. And this is the BRCA1, 2, and ATM group. And you can see a very profound effect um, uh, in, in terms of benefit uh, with biomarker-selected patients. A hazard ratio of 0.34, that means uh, almost a 70% reduction in risk of, of progression, radiographic progression. And they got a second New England Journal paper in 2020 because there was uh, updated overall survival benefit. And you can see that here. The, despite a 67% crossover rate, that is, the placebo patients were able to get Olaparib anyway. The placebo patients still got the uh, Olaparib, and even with this, there was still a survival benefit. But it, what you see on the right here is that if you actually do a, an adjustment for that crossover, um, then the hazard ratio actually goes down to 0.42. Meaning, um, you know, obviously, if you allow people to get a drug, you're going to actually ameliorate, you're going to uh, blunt the benefit. If, if the control group gets the drug, you're going to blunt the survival benefit because they're going to get a benefit from, the, uh, from crossing over. But if you control for that statistically, you can see that these curves really dramatically, uh, dramatically separate. And um, the other point about these drugs, they do have side effects, um, obviously, but uh, Health-related health related quality of life was significantly better in patients who received Olaparib. And uh, I can't remember who brought this up yesterday um, or, or maybe the, today that, oh, actually, I think Alan or, uh, said, you know, if a drug works, you feel better. And I think we always have to remember this. As long as the drug has a reasonable toxicity profile, the, the worst effect on quality of life is progressive cancer. And this is exactly the kind of curve that reminds us that this is true. So they did get an accelerated approval for Olaparib in 2020 based on this, um, uh, based on the profound data that, and, and this obviously with, uh, with the updated survival data is continuing in the setting of HRR mutated um, MCRPC. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the question of whether this, this benefit is independent of biomarker selection, but clearly, uh, in, particularly in BRCA1 and 2 patients, um, there's clear evidence of benefit. Okay, I'm going to assess that. that uh, oops. Okay, so let me go back. Sorry. So there was a lot of uh, data um, with um, uh, uh, in, in phase two studies as well of PARP inhibitor monotherapy for MCRPC, including uh, rocaparib in the Triton 2 study. So at the same time that Olaparib was approved, um, in, in, in prostate cancer, um, rucaparib was also approved uh, in a smaller cohort, BRCA1 or 2 patients, uh, not all of the other DDR genes, and um, they could have had germline or somatic um, biomarker uh, pathogenic variants, um, and they had to have received two th treatments. They had to have received AR-targeted therapies and chemotherapy, so it was a more narrow group that had to have got, uh, progressed on both. So actually, Alan uh, is the first author of this uh, presentation at GU ASCO, and he can certainly speak to it during our panel of Triton 3, which was the overall survival um, data uh, from the randomized study, which is shown here, Rucaparib uh, versus physician's choice in patients who had progressed um, after one AR-targeted therapy. In this case, they were all chemotherapy naive. So this is a an er, slightly earlier stage. They didn't receive chemotherapy, so they could have received chemo or another uh, AR-targeted therapy. And the primary endpoint was RPFS with secondary endpoint of OS or res and response rate. So as Alan pointed out in his GUASCO presentation, this is the largest number of BRCA1, 2, and ATM patients in MCRPC uh, that's ever been uh, published. And you can actually see here really significant numbers of patients. So I think we could certainly argue that this is fairly definitive in terms of the numbers of patients evaluated. This was the primary endpoint in the BRCA subgroup. You can see a very significant delay in PFS. Uh, the hazard ratio 0.61 with a p-value p that's uh, 0 0.0003. Uh, it's clinically significant uh, delay in uh, radiographic progression. Interim OS, this is uh, not a final OS, but you can see that the trend favors um, favors uh, in an intent to treat population, the Rucaparib group, um, uh, with, but the hazard ratio is immature at this point. And then in, in one of the subgroups, which is the ATM subgroup, um, you can see here that there's no benefit. 
So we're gonna during our panel, and I think you've you've seen it hinted at earlier. As we move forward, there's going to be more and more granularity about whether some patients with these so-called DDR mutations do or do not benefit. You can see the BRCA group clearly benefits, and that's driving in this study all of the overall intent to treat benefit. But the ATM subgroup, even though this was a subgroup, uh, it was a pre-planned subgroup analysis, you can see that there didn't seem to be a benefit from a, this PARP inhibitor in the ATM patients. This is going to be important because that was a significant proportion of the patients on this study. So uh, we do see quite a number of ATM muta mutant cancers. So this, this study, Triton 3, met its primary endpoint. Uh, for rucaparib uh, com uh, compared to physician's choice in pre-chemotherapy CRPC. Uh, it reduced the risk of progression, reduced the risk of death, um, statistically significant in RPFS, and, um, and, and many of these patients did, in fact, uh, uh, cross over. So this is the same issue as in the uh, profound study, that the crossover might actually uh, uh, dilute the OS, the ability to interpret OS. We can talk a little bit about that. The other issue, and I didn't show this, but we'll talk about the toxicity, is these drugs do have significant effects on, on, um, on blood counts. They have effects on fatigue, um, although one of the concerns, that, at least that we've seen with some of these um, Myelotoxic drugs is is uh, MDS or other bone marrow diseases, uh, leukemia, and in this so far in this study, these were not shown. The other study at uh, GU ASCO that of course got news and was really important was Talapro, which was a phase three study of talazaparib, an alternative PARP inhibitor, uh, plus enzalutamide versus enzalutamide and a placebo, presented by Niraj Agarwal. So this was an unselected population of patients. Um, of course, they. They took all comers, 805 patients, and they broke them into three groups, unknown, HRR mutated, and HRR, um, uh, HRR mutated um, uh, cohorts, and then um, in the all comers group and versus the ones that were known to be HRR mutated. And the primary endpoint here was RPFS, and it was tal talazaparib plus ENZA versus ENZA uh, plus placebo. And this was also a positive study by RPFS. You can see that the hazard ratio was 0.63, p-value is uh, statistically significant. But um, in the discussion, one of the questions really was, uh, one of the slides that uh, Dr. Agarwal showed was that this reduction in risk of progression or death was seen regardless of HR status. And I don't want to, during my talk, I'm not going to get into this. We'll talk more in the panel because we have two experts in this space. But I think that there was a significant number of patients who are not non-deficient but were unknown. And the real question is, can we really say, and you can see that in this group, the benefit, the non-deficient or unknowns, were actually, the benefit was more modest than in the known HR deficient group. And so I think the controversy here is whether or not um, there is a meaningful reduction in all comers. And I think that uh, you, here's the number. 27% of these patients actually failed tissue testing for, uh, for uh, uh, whether their HR status was, in fact, deficient or non-deficient. And the overall survival, of course, and again, this is interim, uh, with only about 30% maturity, you can see that there's no difference in OS. So should we be measuring the benefit of these drugs with uh, a radiographic progression-free survival, or should we be waiting for uh, overall survival? This is going to be the million-dollar question because the question is, uh, is the RPFS, which was the original primary endpoint, enough to justify the use of this treatment? I think this slide got a lot of controversy because you can see that um, in the combination arm, there was a higher, much higher overall response rate. Uh, including a high percentage of uh, CRs, but this slide was not shown by the different, um, uh, the HR deficient versus non-deficient. So I think uh, Neeraj, who's a wonderful investigator, a great colleague of ours, you know, got a lot of pushback on this slide because it didn't really show uh, the response rate by HRR status. And just to, again, this is for the, for the group of you that may not use a lot of this drug, uh, grade three, four anemia, the most common side effect, almost to half of the men report this, and about 8% actually discontinued because of anemia. So it is something important to manage. If you're a urologist or radiation oncologist, it's, it, it might be different than a medical oncologist who's used to dealing with these drugs. So uh, results from this uh, suggest, uh, suggest, suggested that really um, Talapro 2, that, that uh, oh, let me go back, I'm sorry. 
um, that that this should be considered regardless of HRR um, uh, gene status. But I think that this is again Dr. Castro's uh, discussion slide. I think that the, the real issue is this balance between um, the, the benefit of the combination and whether or not RPFS is equal to OS. And I think it's a really important point uh, because in fact we know that these drugs have value in biomarker selected patients. I think the question is in patients without, truly without uh, one of these um, uh, HRR mutation um, uh, tumors, are they benefiting from this? Are there unknown uh, mutations that we do not, are not measuring for. So my patient that I started with had been through, um, he had this family history that was certainly intriguing and in fact genomic testing ultimately did show that he had a germline BRCA2 mutation. He started on Olaparib and, and clearly had significant benefit. Um, we have seen these really, uh, we talked about these miraculous, I think it was Oliver talking about in the context of of um, um, IO therapy for some prostate cancer patients, but we definitely see, have seen some dramatic benefits with PARP inhibitors, particularly in BRCA2 patients. Um, I think the real question is, you know, are, are, is it going to be in all comers uh, based on studies like Propel and, and Talapro2, or are we going to be continuing to select patients based on, um, based on their biomarker selection? And this is really my conclusion slide. These drugs are important. Recent FDA approvals will allow us to continue to benefit patients with DNA repair deficient prostate cancer. Uh, which mutations matter? I think it's going to be an important conversation. And whether patients without biomarker selection, uh, without these mutations, will benefit is, is, is I think, uh, probably the thing that we'll learn about in the next few months and, and the next few years. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.